Hey everyone, welcome back to the Diet Doc Life Mastery Podcast. I'm Joe Kunzeski here with our medical director, Dr. Jennifer Souders, who is also on our board of directors for the Global Nutrition Mastermind coming up, Nutrition Coaching Global Mastermind. So Jen, thanks for uh, joining again. I know we keep coming back to you as a resource because in this pandemic, I don't think anybody can use great information uh, at, at too small of intervals. We all need it. We're all searching the news every day, trying to find voices that are, are giving us true information. And that's what I want to talk about today, if you don't mind. Uh, how long is this going to last? What's this going to look like? There are a lot of models coming out, especially one right in your backyard, University of Washington up there in Seattle. But be before we get to that, I want to see if you would entertain a question for me. Oh, absolutely. Okay. If I offered you a million dollars or I gave you the option, I'm going to see if you were paying attention in first grade, the option of having a penny doubled every day for 30 days. So I can give you a million dollars now or double a penny every day for 30 days. Which would you take? Oh, the penny. Absolutely. Because that is worth $5 million in 30 days. And right. that's exactly the power of exponentialism or the cumulative process of, of anything you can imagine. And it, it blew some people's minds. I posted the other day that a, a professor in London, uh, a medical practitioner said, look, because this is such a transmissible infection, because uh, you know we get kind of lulled into thinking it's not that bad when you hear, well, it's just 3% or so. But as he said, 3% compared to the seasonal flu of 0.1 to 0.2% as an infection rate, you're looking at infecting maybe 14 people with the flu if you had a flu infection. But with this COVID virus, you're looking at 59,000. So 59,000 versus 14. And I just don't think enough people who are not in the medical field understand that that kind of epidemiology is what's driving this. A lot of people still, I had two conversations on the phone yesterday with friends who were still saying, gosh, why is this such a big deal? Why, I, you know, I hate it that, that a few thousand people are dying, but why are we shutting down the whole world for this? And how would you answer this now that we are four or so months in? Well, I think it, it really is based on what you were just talking about with exponential growth. So first, we have a highly transmissible pathogen. We have no immunity to it, no vaccines, no, no definitive treatments. It's very readily spread, and it can be spread for quite a long time before people who have it develop symptoms, and some of them never do develop symptoms. So they are not even knowing that they are spreading it and infecting others. Um, we know that there are super spreaders who, for everyone who maybe has like a five person transmission to their asymptomatic infection, the super spreaders can be 30 to one or greater. So there's that. Um, the fact that it can um, basically also stay present in your body um, for weeks after your symptoms have cleared. So again, you can still be shedding viruses. And this is true for regular influenza too. Um, if you have regular influenza or even just a head cold after you're asymptomatic and you feel better, um, you can still be infecting other people for up to two weeks after that even though you are not sick. So again, one of the big problems with this particular virus is not just the lack of treatments and the, the lack of testing and the severity of some of the infections, but the fact that it is so readily transmissible and it can be transmissible before, during, or after the whole acute infectious process. So really what one person can do Un, unknown to them is vast. And here in Washington state, this is what we found. We had one guy who came back from Wuhan that we knew of in mid-January. And look at where we are. Now, again, we are a Pacific Rim economy. Most of the West Coast is. So when you think about that, how many people could have been coming in? But the virology shows that at least in, um, 
in Washington state and throughout much of the West Coast that it's really coming from these particular genotypes that are just basically related to that first known seeding. And it's, it's spread like wildfire. So when you think of maybe just one person has touched off all of this, I mean, really, it, it starts to, to boggle the mind. It's a little hard to wrap your head around it. But we're, I mean, the genotype from here in, in Washington state has been found in Great Britain and in Europe and other places, but much of it is here and, and seeded into the, the east coast of um, the United States. And the east coast is, of course, with their economy, getting a lot of genotypes in from Europe. And, and when you just look at the global spread of this, how far it has gone and how many people have been infected in such a relatively short time, you have to understand that the spread is, is very dangerous and that without the ability to know for such a long time before you may even have an inkling that you possibly could be infected, um, the danger is very high. And that's just it. You know, I, I mentioned last time we spoke that, that it's probable in my mind that I brought it back to the Midwest and, and maybe multiple people did. But when I was on the West Coast in late January and we've done a little CSI-ing in, uh, in this area myself, but uh, I, I came back, had every symptom you could imagine from the very, very strong pneumonia type symptoms to, to a, a fever that just, you know, expanded through an entire week. And then my daughter had that, and then she went and saw a friend in Indianapolis, and, and she had those exact same symptoms a week after I did. And now, in retrospect, we found out that they did. And uh, she also went to work, and uh, she, she discovered that a friend the week after a, a coworker you know, had it and then gave it to her parents. Then I went down for a meeting in Nashville, and one of the first shutdowns in Nashville was on the exact floor in the building where I was. And so again, one person, unwittingly just saying, I didn't even think I could have caught the COVID virus out there because there were just a couple known cases at that time. And I just thought, you know, 21 million people in LA, I joked about it. There's just, you know, there's no way I'm, I'm going to catch it out here. But we know now that there were probably hundreds, if not thousands of people. And, and one of the things we found out this week is in Iceland, a country of around 350,000, they've tested about 10% of their population and now they have up to 40 different strains. So not only is this thing mutating very quickly, but it's spreading uh, that fast. And I, I'd like to hear your opinion or maybe what you're hearing on what Governor Cuomo is talking about in terms of a, a, a quickly read, or, or readily available um, you know, antibody test, because I would like to know. I mean, one of the things to get this economy back on track, which is something I want to talk about, is going to be finding out who actually has had this so we can say, okay, I'm, I'm not at risk. I don't have to be super afraid. And maybe I can be one of the people who goes back to work because, you know, I should have the antibodies. But are you hearing about any, any testing that could be online pretty quickly for that? Nothing specifically yet that is like ready to go. I know it's it's definitely a priority. It's something that's been discussed. Um, I think there's still quite a bit of questions as to whether people really do have full immunity given the mutation rate and the different sourcings of this virus because when you can virology, uh, virologically, I'm looking for the right word here, uh, identify different genotypes of the virus, which means different genetic fingerprints for it, and the, the mutations that come from a given one. That w These are expected. All these viruses mutate. That It's part of RNA viruses. That's what they do. But do you have pan immunity? So if you have immunity to one, um, do you have immunity to them all? I think that's a concern for people. Um, I think that there's certainly... Uh, a big concern for for surges, which we'll probably talk about later too, in terms of with the complexity of the different genotypes. And once we have travel and things like that, um, would would you be immune to something from the West Coast, but maybe not something that came from Europe? 
I mean, so you went back to work, but some dude flew in from Germany and uh, it was in your community and, and would, would you get it again? We, I don't think we know. Yeah, they, they have found out so far that in China, about 10% of people that have had it have gotten it again. And, and, and I agree with some of the initial skepticism that, well, maybe our tests, the first test or the second test wasn't quite up to par. Uh, they are still improving some of the testing methods. So, um, you know, I, I think that's yet to be seen. But, but even at that record, you know, 10% is probably, as you're describing, creating that herd immunity. I mean, a, a novel pathogen is, is really the core of the concern or, or the, the novelty of it. So it's going to take some surges and so forth. And that's, that's another thing I did want to mention. Uh, in the healthcare community, and I know you don't practice per se in a hospital setting, but I, I think one of the things that is missing so far in helping people understand this is just what it's doing to the medical system and for anybody who needs anything to receive care. So, you know, when, when people hear about running out of beds, we're already at ICU capacity, we're building triage hospitals on football fields and, and you know, buying hotels to, to fab those into surgical suites and housing units. I mean, how bad could this get? Because back to that, that exponential number, Everybody was watching this with bated breath and oh my gosh, we've got the first, you know, two cases turned into four and then oh my gosh, we're up to 15 and then it seemed like forever it took to get 100 and now we're getting 100, 200, 300 deaths in the US every day. I mean, you saw how quickly we surged past China in Italy in cases right. and in testing aside because that's going to, you know, create a, a higher spike. But in terms of, you know, transmitting this virus throughout the entire population, you know, what is that going to truly look like for somebody's ability to go have an appendectomy or, um, you know, they, they need a, an emergency, you know, stent put in a, 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 an artery in their heart when, when everybody is focused on this? Well, obviously here in Seattle, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty ahead of the curve. And you don't even, you, all you need to do is read the Seattle Times newspaper and uh, get, get an understanding of, of the facts. You don't even need to be in any kind of allied healthcare profession whatsoever because the news is, is being so well transmitted here. But so for instance, we have the National Guard coming from Colorado. Now they're setting up field hospitals in the Seahawks Stadium, CenturyLink Field. What they are going to be doing is they're going to be using that hospital to treat people who are sick, who need hospital care, that's not COVID-19 related. Because guess what? People are still going to wind up with a, you know, a heart attack, um, a stroke, a, a need for an appendectomy, um, a broken leg that requires surgery, things like that. And in order to care for those people who aren't infected or infectious, we need to have a separate area so that they don't secondarily get infected from being in an environment that's dedicated to the care of COVID-19 patients. So what it's looking like here is a, is a separation of facilities. So the, the major institutions that are already in place are going to be providing the care for the COVID-19 population and separate medical practitioners in separate areas um, geographically are going to, to take care of the other needs of the population that do not entail COVID-19 in order to separate those people and keep them safer. So there's that, that that's one of the big considerations. The, um, the information like Dr, or excuse me, Governor Cuomo has talked about and a lot of concerns in a number of areas of the, the country that are hard hit is what we, what we see generally speaking, to just generalize, is someone becomes infected they don't have any symptoms until perhaps maybe five days later. And then they start to, you know, they start to feel sick. If they can get testing, they do. Now the tests are available. What we've discovered out here is that there's, there's been a problem in terms of people getting referred to get the testing so that the capacity may be there. And now the roadblock is actually accessing a doctor who will refer you to it. Um, because people are overwhelmed. So there's, there's a, a factor right there. 
Um, but also you may get sick and you may be told, well, you're able to isolate at home, quarantine at home, things like that. Um, but then in another five to 12 days, you may or may not be getting better. And then you may need the critical care. So there you may need hospitalization and that can sometimes just be supportive care and oxygen, but then oftentimes that leads to um, ventilation and in the really severe cases, you know, the, the membrane oxygenation of the blood. Um, so those, those factors, they take a while to develop. What they're projecting out here is our biggest bed surge is probably going to show up in mid-April here. Where that's going to fall with other areas of the country is going to depend where you are on your exponential curve and where your peak is and how successful you are at trying to flatten that curve. And what you talked about with the, with the cases going up is a, is a combination of improved testing plus in, increased spread. So it's very difficult yet. If you look at the data from China, when they had the lockdown, the, in, in, when you go backwards in time and the cases are finally closed, in other words, they've, they've identified, they've, they've settled whether the person died or whether the person recovered or whether they actually had it. The, the incidents kept rising and rising and rising for several weeks after the full, full, very draconian lockdown. But when you see the actual closed cases, they were starting to descend then. So the, the, the issue is there has to be sort of a back calculation as to when did they actually get infected. And it, you, you really have a hard time knowing that where we are right now. So using the data out of China and other places that are ahead of the curve is going to be helpful for other areas of the world moving forward. So areas where we are now on the West Coast that are ahead of the process is going to be helpful in basically educating how other areas are going to move forward. Does that that's answer your question? Well, yeah, that, that's almost a maddening issue with this is because everybody is almost forced to play from behind. You, you see what's happening in Spain right now. They're surging ahead, uh, even though they had all of the warning, because it's very difficult for people to take this seriously. I mean, even our own president is saying, hey, we're going to fill the churches up in April. We're going to be back to business. And then, you know, other medical professionals are saying, look, that, that may be just the beginning of the increase toward the peak. Like what you're seeing now, going from a couple thousand cases to over 100,000 cases, that's not even going to show up on the graph by the time we're done because we're going up into the millions. And that's why I started this podcast off discussing the, the cumulative nature of exponential numbering. And, you know, University of Washington, again, right in your backyard, said, said our most accurate model that we can predict right now is going to be around 80,000 U.S. citizens dead. So we're looking right now at the numbers saying, well, 2,000, that's not bad. That's, you know, it's, we're kind of on pace for a normal seasonal flu. But this is with all of the efforts we're seeing, all of the, the, the self-quarantining, all of the, uh, the, the lockdown shelter-in-place orders, it's taking all of that just to keep us down to a hopeful 80,000 deaths versus the CDC's worst case scenario estimates of, of up to 2 million. And so, you know, when I look at this, Jen, I'm, I'm just struck by the fact that we've had a stay in, in place uh, order from our governor for a week now. And yet I have driven to work a couple times because I have an independent office. I don't come in contact with anybody. That's within the scope of our Indiana executive order that if that's your case and you have to keep a business running, that's fine. But I'm driving down the street and I've never seen our streets busier. I, I, saw, I saw moms playing with 10 kids, just running around, playing tag, bumping into each other, all, the, all this stuff. I, I see like nobody here is taking this seriously. And so the, the threat that we will become Italy or Spain or, or just the worst of these countries, we are not doing what China did to completely lock this down. And so, you know, even uh, Bill Gates, who, who gave the, his now famous or infamous uh, TED Talk, I believe in 2016, on Ebola, and he predicted, you know, the next, the next, the next time 10 million people die in the U.S. is not going to be because of a nuclear war. It's going to be a pandemic. It's going to be a pathogen. And, and he was speaking off the heels of the Ebola virus. And I have to say, 
if, if we have ever been forced into something just as a practice round, thank goodness it's with this. Because if something ever did hit like Ebola, which has something like what, about a 50% lethality rate. I mean, if, if you get Ebola, you know, you either die or you wish you would have died. And, and if that thing had not been contained to just a couple rural areas in Africa where a lot of people were not traveling, I mean, we could be exactly in the scenario he described with 10 million dropping dead just like that. So uh, I, I would like to transition, if you don't mind, into what you really think is the most predictable because The Atlantic, a medical writer for The Atlantic, said here are the four possible scenarios. And he said, very similar to Bill Gates, best case scenario, we could be looking at a two to four month shut down, slow down, it's only gonna get worse. Everybody who's been sheltering in place for two to three weeks, and, and I get it, we're, we're stir crazy, we wanna get back to normal. We even just have this innate sense of, okay, I've been worried about this now for a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm sick of being worried, I'm ready to get back to normal, but it's just gonna get worse. And best case scenario is two to four months. Uh, even somebody like Lindsey Graham, a Republican senator who usually sides with President Trump, in this whole economy versus lives debate, he rightly said, there's gonna be no economy to come back to if we don't contain this virus. And so the next best case scenario is instead of two to four months, this thing could last from the next four months through the end of the year because people, communities, states are still not taking it seriously. And so you're just gonna keep seeing this roll from one city to the next, one state to the next. And we just never get through this until the middle of next year. So you, as a, as a physician, sitting in what was the epicenter for a country, the starting point, what can you realistically predict is going to happen over the next few months? I would say, you know, I, I, as, as you know, I follow the, the virology department locally, um, Bill Gates, you know, all these resources are local for me. So I, I do read a lot about this. Um, I would say, I really am psychologically prepared to write off all of 2020. I really am. And there's a couple reasons why. First, if we go back to the pandemic of 1918, there were three surges, right? So you, you, had, you had the surge initially. You had, they, they did social distancing at that time and it was somewhat successful, loosened up a little bit. All of us who've been isolating and not in contact and not getting infected, we start going out and mixing it up again. And those of us who don't have the immunity, well, now we're gonna get infected because there's still going to be that pool of people. You just don't know. So there will, then there'll be another surge and I think it may, be, it may be economically more harmful if you, if you have a second surge and you have to pull back. Mm -hmm. The whole thing with, with the healthcare resources is to try to keep a steady flow. Like if you were filling a bucket that had a hole in the bottom, right? You, you wanna pace the amount of water going in with how much water's coming out the bottom of the bucket. You don't want it overflowing over the top. And so the surges are, are the problem is that you get too many cases developing all at once and the capacity to handle them is not there. So the whole process of this isolation, this flattening the curve, means that we've got a steady inflow, outflow of patients into critical care, understanding that there's still going to be serial um, cases of infection and illness and severe illness and recovery. And until we have some other means of either better treatment, which treatment is obviously more likely to happen before uh, vaccination, I think, realistically. But we really need to contain that. And I think there's, there's an issue with trying to manage the fact that the infections will continue as we go through this process. So maybe at the end of four months, 
if the restrictions are, are lessened and people go out more, I think it's very likely we're going to see a surge. And I think our individual decision-making process on that um, has to be sort of, as the financial planners say, is, is got to be relative to your risk tolerance. So for instance, myself, so I, last year, I, you know, stopped doing clinical work because I knew I was going to become a full-time caregiver. And so first, it, you know, it's my, my mom and my dad and now my husband. And the great thing is I'm keeping, I, I keep people out of these, these facilities where everyone's dying, getting sick, you know, so I, so, so doing full-time caregiving is, uh, and I have, you know, friends uh, with cancer and things like that. Um, doing that is important in the community. It's what I can do to help my community. And, you know, everyone has to do their part. And we've talked about that in our previous episodes. But then when I think about it too, what is my risk tolerance? It's not about me. It's about the people that I'm a caregiver for. And their risk tolerance is maybe a lot different than mine personally. So can I afford to end social distancing and isolation protocols at the same time other people might? I don't think so. Not at all. Not if I, not if I care about the people who are the people I'm taking care of. Not if I care about my community and not if I care about the greater good um, that, that befalls other people. So I think there's going to be a, a risk tolerance factor some people with young children who need them to go to school, well, they, you know, they're going to play with a different set of, of risk analysis benefit curves. You know, they're, they're going to have to look at it individually. But I think each one of us at this point should be sort of assessing where we are right now and where, that, where that's going to go. Um, because I think once you're in this pattern of the social isolation, I think once you get your sort of routine down, um, it's easier to maintain it than to go backwards. And I think all, what we don't need is surges of infection and hoarding and panic and all this other stuff just repeated over and over again. I think that could potentially be more economically damaging. I don't know what you think about that, but from an economic standpoint, what, what's your take on that, Joe? Well, I do agree that we're going to be dealing with this for the rest of the year exactly are we as we are now rolling from one city one community to the next but i i i believe that the american people will not have the stomach for it and so we will end up like like 1918 going through some waves and some resurgence because people are just going to be done and the unfortunate thing and i don't want to talk about this politically it, it's water under the bridge but i think for learning purposes for the next time this happens uh, we need to understand how light this could have been in terms of impact had we just done what we're attempting to do now in January. Uh, you know, when you look at those countries like Singapore and, and China, once they went into a full martial law shutdown, you know, what they were able to do to contain that, that would have been so much less economic damage and so fewer lives lost. And and once we get some of these big hot spots like New York starting to come down off of the peak, I think you're going to see politicians and Americans alike just say, okay, we're done. I don't care how many more people die. I'll keep washing my hands, but I, I've got to go to work. You know, unemployment benefits will be, you know, starting this next week and, and going for the next 13 weeks. That's going to have impact. But even something like the stimulus, $2 trillion stimulus bill, recovery bill, you know, that's going to help people pay their rent or their mortgage for the next month. And then it's over. You know, I, I mentioned uh, all of the people that, that, you know, have me almost aghast in Evansville that are still out and about. I mean, I get it. If, if you've got a job that's still affording you the opportunity to go earn that paycheck, you're going to do that. Uh, you're not going to stay at home. So I, I know we should. And uh, I was very happy to see that in the last seven days, the amount of people responding to the poll you know, do you think this is serious, uh, went up by 20 percentage points. And so, you know, once, uh, you know, some politicians and, and other news media organizations that were very much on the side of this is a hoax, it's no big deal. Once they all came on board and started having medical expert, ex experts and scientists on air, now all of a sudden, you know, many more people are taking it seriously. But still, 
uh, we're not going to see as a society just a, a stay in place order for, you know, e even the next 30 days, I don't think. They, they may move those community to community, but they will start to lighten. And I think that is going to create some uh, economic uh, impact negatively for some people who do have to deal with medical conditions and as you said loved ones getting sick and hospitalized and potentially dying and other people i think you're going to start seeing a little bit of an economic recovery situationally because people are back to work uh you know like i said i, I don't i don't know when this could happen that the next big move would be for some governor somewhere to say okay i'm lifting the ban on restaurants bars and gyms now you can go back to that side of your life and talk about a, an awful big chance for transmission, you know, that, that will be the testing ground for how herd immunity has really worked. Um, but I, I'm looking at, like I said, a lot of this rolling through our country for the entire next year. But I really think in July, probably early July, you're going to see a lot of things resuming as people just do accept those risks. Right. And that, that's my guess as well. And that's why I say it's going to be an individual decision about risk tolerance. Work is maybe one thing. What I would call, you know, optional things like whether you would actually want to go out to a restaurant as opposed to continue to simply continue to order from it as a takeout or delivery until you're sure. You know, again, it, it really is going to depend on, on your individual risk tolerance and, you know, what the, what the family and community and group of loved ones around you is. So if you have young kids that are gonna go, well, they won't go back to school in the summer, most likely, but if you have young kids that are going back to school, but grandma lives in the house with you, you know, I, th I think these are things that people now, before this happens, the important point about this podcast, I think is people need to start thinking now, do the process that we could have, should have done maybe two months ago that you just mm -hmm. talked about, do it now in your head. We've learned a lot of really good habits now. We're practicing these habits. They don't have to be abandoned. We should still continue with our hand washing, our distancing when we can, when appropriate. Maybe we should no longer shake hands. Maybe we can just nod and smile from across the room. Maybe we really should keep six feet distance in meeting rooms things like that. Maybe we should try to make our meetings, um, you know, smaller. Maybe because we've invested all of this time and effort in telecommuting, maybe we can continue a lot of that in a very functional manner without economic consequences to allow business to move forward while still maintaining a lower level of risk than what we had prior to this whole social distancing and isolation. I think we should, you know, I don't know why we tolerated sitting in traffic an hour each way, wasting that time when, when we could now with things in place the way they are, could we work smarter? Could we save more money? Mm -hmm. Could we be more efficient? If you're not sitting in the car two hours a day, that means those two hours a day, you're at home and you're available to work. You, you, you are not non-productive in that time. So I think we could start economically beginning to move forward with a new normal that may actually present its own form of economic stimulus by enhancing productivity. And uh, once, once the, the setup is in place and people have been successfully doing it, maybe there should be some planning going forward starting now as to are we going to have like rolling days in maybe mm. maybe everyone's going to have three days at home and two in the office or vice versa and stagger those days too mm. um that would be something that could very easily be planned for and help to decrease surges while increasing economic productivity and getting people back into a normal life mm. well i will wrap us up by saying this i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna take your advice there and, and move that five yards down the field in saying that I really hope this is an opportunity where we decide we have to finally start respecting experts. Uh, it, is, it is especially uh, frustrating for me to see this ongoing war against science 
in, in our in our culture that it has become so politicized that you can you can you know based on a political party affiliation or a religious belief system you can say no those scientists are wrong 97 percent of the world scientists all agree but i think it's a big conspiracy uh you're seeing that happen now in real time where politicians and people who just wanted to make sure the economy went forward we're just going to hope this goes away we're going to hope we don't have the impact and and again if we could have compared the economic impact from just doing this initially in January, my goodness, I mean, forget about the lives lost. It would have been just a fraction of what is, is happening now. So uh, I really hope this is, is a lesson that we'll carry forward. And Jen, I appreciate your willingness to be uh, with me on this podcast because uh, of all the things I have done in my career, my public health and my general health hat is something that I generally keep on the hat rack. Uh, I'm, I'm busy doing nutrition and, and personal development work with our coaches. And uh, it's, this is not something I would like to keep doing. So hopefully we'll move through this uh, very soon. Yeah, and we're all going to probably need some hats. Well, maybe you won't, but like when my hair grows out and hasn't been cut for four months, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, at least I'm going to be happy to wear some kind of hat. It may not be a public health hat, but it'll, it'll, it'll probably be a ball cap. <laughs> okay. Well, again, I appreciate you doing this, especially on a weekend. You stay safe out there, and hopefully you'll have at least some continued good weather so you can get out. And everybody watching and listening to the Life Mastery Podcast, thanks. Uh, please share this with people who you think may still need some updated information. We're going to get this out uh, right away so it's, it's current. And we'll catch you next time in uh, the Life Mastery Podcast.